The crimes, the criminals, why did they do it? Who got hurt? Did they meet justice or commit the perfect crime? You'll find all the clues at Jim Harold's Crime Scene. Welcome to the Crime Scene. I am Jim Harold, and so glad to be with you. And we have a return guest today. And uh, this is perhaps one of the more disturbing cases that we've talked about uh, on the program. It's the case of Wayne Bowden also known as Strangler Bill or the Vampire Rapist. And uh, again, this is another Canadian case. So we bring in our resident expert on uh, uh, Canadian crimes, uh, Alan Warren. And the book is Bloodthirst, the true story of Wayne uh, uh, Bowden, Vampire Rapist Serial Killer. It's part of the Crimes Canada, True Crimes That Shock the Nation uh, series, and it's volume 18. Uh, Alan, uh, welcome to the program. Well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, great, great show you have. I appreciate it. So tell us about Wayne Bowden. I had not heard of him. Uh, what did he do, and, and when was he uh, uh, committing these heinous crimes? Well, you know, he was actually the first real vampire killer that we have any knowledge of. I mean, he started doing this back in the 60s. Um, in Montreal, and he worked his way west to Calgary and continued. So he uh, liked to uh, rape, kill, and drink the blood of his victims. Oh, my God. So, uh, you know, I think the difference between him and the few that have come out in the States is that um, he didn't partake in eating other body parts, whereas, you know, the Sacramento one and some of the other ones out there were... Dahmer and people in, like that. Yeah, they were e into eating and all this stuff. He actually just wanted the blood. Now, um, let's, I guess, start at the beginning now. He has uh, since passed. But yeah. let's talk about his growing up years. When you take a look at, at somebody like this, usually I think the natural reaction of most people is to say, well... Uh, obviously, this person had a troubled childhood. Something horrible happened to them, and it twisted them for life. Where they, uh, where they did these horrible, heinous crimes. Was there any sign of that in his, uh, in his makeup, in his background? Did he have a normal background, or, or was it uh, a childhood full of tragedy? As far as we know. No, actually, I, I, it's hard to determine that there was anything that would stick out. You know, he. Um, lived in a rural part of uh, Hamilton, which is a steel town in Canada. And, um, you know, so he grew up uh, walking a couple miles to school, um, lived with his parents. His father did die when he was a teenager, and uh, he so he stayed living with his mother. He um, did fairly well in school. He got into some fights with other kids. Uh, you know, it wasn't, there was nothing you would, pick out and go, wow, that was kind of weird. It, it, you know, his his mother was not affectionate or the touching, feely type. Um, she was very strict with him as well. Um, but but there was nothing outrageous. Yeah, He never got beat. He never got uh, attacked or assaulted by any of his family members or so. So, uh, you know, looking in the childhood, in the teenage years, it was kind of average. So um, a lot of times we'll hear about, oh, one of these serial killers when he was a kid, he, the kid, he liked to torture animals, pull the wings off of flies, things like that. Nothing uh, nothing like that with Bowden. No, actually, the only thing I found, because he even dated uh, a couple of girls, one for about a year, and um, he, um, he got into a couple of fights with other kids because he was – he played football, but he was still uh, loved teachers. He was known as a teacher's pet. He would stay after school, clean off the boards, uh, hang out with the teachers. He really got along with his teachers. Like he spent a lot of his time that way. But that, that's, again, not really an unusual thing. You know, we, we've all known people that were teachers' favorites or people that were considered that, you know, I, I don't see it's enough where you'd want to start killing people, you know? 
And I mean, in his relationship with women, did did he have, um, you know, I, I guess what we would consider usual, typical teenage boy relationships with women? Did he seem to have problems with women? What, what, where, where was he in that regard? Well, it was kind of, uh, you know, he dated, we, I was able to find two different girls that he dated, uh, one for about a year. Both said he was, uh, the girls really liked him, I should say. He was a um, football player, so he was built well. He was uh, good looking. He had the hair and sideburns, which was in style back then. So he was very, uh, very good that way. And he was soft spoken, very polite hold doors open, pull chairs back for ladies. He was, you know, he was a good person up front. So people um, like to be around him. Um, both girls had nothing bad to say about dating him. Um, in fact, he was a complete gentleman. In fact, the one said that he uh, never made any moves sexually toward her um, for a whole year. So, um they separated, but uh, that it wasn't really a negative to her. It was just kind of, well, you know, he's not interested. Interesting. Well, um, okay, so so we, we take a look at him. What, by all appearances from the outside, a, a relatively normal, well-adjusted teenager. Um, where do you think? the worm started to turn. I mean, uh, wasn't, wasn't that much, uh, I don't believe beyond his high school years that the first, uh, victim was, uh, found. Uh, um, so when do you think it started to turn for him? Or do you think this was something that was always kind of boiling in the background and it was a case of, uh, still, uh, waters running very deep and very twisted. Well, I think it was something that was, going along right from the background because because both girls that he uh, dated he never became sexual with and he moved on to the city after gradu graduating because he in his mind thought he could be a model or something like that um, so he went to Hamilton but it wasn't the right city because again it's an industrial steel town so then he went over to Montreal and um, started pursuing to become a model, uh, and so in his in his mind, it, you know, you, you, you just, again, you don't see anything weird um, until Montreal, where he would uh, write about how he would go to the main boulevards like Saint Catherine, where all the shopping is, and he would stand amongst, you know, the thousands of people going up and down the road, and he would just stand in everyone's way, close his eyes, look up toward the sky, and hold his arms out. And he would let all the people bump by him and push him and and be irritated with him. And he enjoyed that. And he started writing that huh. in his memoir about about how it gave him a thrill. Uh, and, and so that was the first thing I thought was, well, that's kind of weird. Um, you know, it just seemed strange to me. I, I I never thought about doing that in any city I have ever lived in. Um, <laughs> And so, so that was the first thing that really stuck up. So I don't know if it was something that happened between that time to him um, when he was getting to Montreal or in Hamilton. Um, but also the clue is that he wouldn't get sexual with the girls he dated. And later we found that the ones that he did kill and drink their blood, it was because he needed to drink the blood in order to be aroused. Oh, my goodness. How strange. Uh, yeah, so 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 this might have been the problem when he was a teenager. Maybe he was aware of this thing and didn't know how to deal with it. And as he got away from home and into the city and he started dating women in Montreal, um, then this, that's when it started to happen. Because, you know, every one of these ladies that he uh, had killed and raped and drank their blood, he was dating for a period of time. What, what I don't understand, and we mark this episode explicit, I don't want to get too explicit, but I mean, how would you make the leap of logic? Let's say that a man were uh, unable to perform, let's say, and, and and he would say, well, perhaps if I drink the blood of a, of a person, perhaps that will uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, bring me, uh, bring me more excitement. I mean, how do you make that leap of logic? That just makes, uh, I, I don't, 
I don't see how you get from, you know, point A to point B there. I don't know how you make that leap of logic. Oh, well, you know, it wouldn't come across to us right away. But what, what I did think was there was a, um, a girl in Montreal, um, um, I think the Mar- – no, one of them. I f- there was a girl in Montreal that at first when they were convicting him and charging him, um, they thought he had done it. Uh, Norma Valancourt. And uh, she was killed in the same manner. And at first he was the suspect. And later they ended up convicting another guy. Now this happened before the, the other four or five girls. So what what I found out was why they thought that was because he had left something at the scene of the crime. So he was there, but he didn't do it. And now this lady and the guy that got convicted were both involved in an S and M club. So he must have joined that sort of sect, that club. And was involved with them into the S and M world at the time that that girl got killed, and the person that killed her also drank her blood. So, so this might have introduced him to that way of thinking. That sort of that, that's the only connection I can make because here you have a guy that comes to the city, he has a problem with uh, performing with girls, probably because he doesn't do it. And then when he does get involved, he ends up doing this sort of same scenario, drinking the blood and then raping them and stuff. So it sort of fits. So whether he was introduced or watching it or involved with this other girl and the person that did it, I don't know. Um, we can't really lock that down. You know, it's, it, we just know he was there. Something happened. The girl got killed. She was uh, drained of blood and raped and strangled. But we just know the other guy did it. So he now was Ra- Raymond Swab. Yeah. So so these 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 women, every one of them that, who was killed was dating him at one point or another. Correct, you said. Uh, yes, actually, and and it was while they were still seeing each other that he the murder happened. And the first victim, you know, who was the first victim? Well, the first one we know that he did was Shirley Audette, and that would have been in October of nineteen sixty nine. And they found her dumped in the rear of her apartment building. And she had been uh, raped and severe bite marks on her neck and both breasts. One of the nipples was almost bit off. And she was dressed again after all of that and thrown in the back of the apartment building. Um, so, And he lived in the same building. Uh, uh... So, <laughs> he was the neighbor. <laughs> So, so um, I always have this question for people when we're talking about silly, uh, serial killers. I probably even uh, talked about this with our previous uh, interview about the, the well, I was going to say gentleman, but the man who was a military officer and so forth. I always think there's an interesting uh, answer to this question. Um, wh- I think most people, when they hear about somebody like this, they think, oh, my God, he must have been insi- insane. But if you look at criminally insane, I believe that one of the criteria is that they don't know what they're doing is wrong. And, and But when people, you know, obviously know what they're doing is wrong, they try to cover it up, they try to cover their tracks. I don't believe they're technically criminally insane. Do you think that um, Baden was, uh, 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 or I always get mixed up, Baden or Bowden, do you think he was criminally insane? Was he insane? I mean, something had to be malfunctioning here. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. And you know what? The best answer I've ever had was by uh, Sam Amaranti. He was the defense attorney for uh, Gacy. Um, John Wayne Gacy, and uh, he had a really good statement about that, about how when you when you break a leg, you have a broken bone, and when you have um, a disease, you have a disease. Like he sort of explained how you can have all these ailments that we consider as an ailment, as, as a you know, it's a physical problem, but when we go to mental, uh, you can't have a broken brain. And and that's sort of a tough thing for people to analyze. So, so, you know, did he have something wrong with him? Did he have a broken part of the brain? Probably. Um, the legal aspect of it's the hard one because, uh, you know, they try to determine a line of were you insane? 
You know, was it a rage that caused you to do it and you went insane? Or or was it you have a mental defect? But then where do you draw that line when you start cleaning up afterwards? Um, or if you plan it out, is that insanity, you know, um, and temporary? And that's the one they always go for, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's true. Um, so there were, was it four victims? Was it five victims? How many victims in total are we talking about? We think five. There were six, but he was only convicted on four. So that's that's the best way I can say it, um, because there wasn't enough proof on one. The other one was the one we described, I, I talked about earlier, that he was there, but it was another man that actually did it. And that man got put away for... 10 years did the victims or the modus operandi change as we went victim to victim to victim to the several victims or was it pretty much the same mo every time no it was pretty much the same mo in fact i can say you know that um other than the jewelry clerk uh the other ladies um were all teachers or studying to be teachers and remember when he was in school he was the teacher's pet he loved Interesting. hanging out with them. So there was something about an intelligent woman. And that's the other tie I have to the one that was not a teacher. Um, her name was uh, Mario Archambault. She was a jewelry clerk, but she was a very independent, um, almost aggressive woman. She was kind of like the Mary Tyler Moore in the sense that she had her own apartment. She was uh, like 21 years old, and she's in the city living on her own and working. You know, in the 60s, people got to realize that was very independent. Right. <laughs> that was not like commonplace like it is now. It, w it was something that uh, really stuck out. And he actually had seen her on the road when she was out shopping. And that's when he first saw her. And he just noticed how she was very assertive and she was able to do things on her own. So he sort of had a, I think he had sort of a good feeling. He really liked ladies that were independent and smart like a teacher now um he had like a calling card in most of the cases very odd he he always bit or most of the time bit his victims it was a very odd thing and i guess it actually helped lead to his uh his arrest can you talk about that because i found it to be such an odd thing well you know he started out you know because like i said he would sort of date them or see them for a while and um and then what would happen is, in his memoir part that he wrote, his mem his kind of, I don't know, diary you'd call it, he started talking about how when he remembered doing it, he was, um, the, the girl had come on to him, and they were kind of making out, and he uh, would have to bite to draw the blood in order to get um, aroused enough to do this have sex. And of course, then the lady would fight. And then so he would end up choking them and stopping them from fighting and kill them. And then he would rape them. And it depends on what after that. But his biting was uh, ferocious on the breasts and the neck over and over on all of the girls. And uh, yeah, and that's sort of how they found him because um, what they had done is they... Um, had heard about uh, a case, there's a couple cases in England where they were taking dental impressions to convict killers, you know, their bite marks. And so uh, they, they took his dental impression and he didn't say no. He said, yeah, sure, take it. Because at that time, nobody knew that they could do that. And so he st they took that and then they could pick out the 29 points of uh, your, your jaw and your impression on someone or something if you bite it and he would match on 27 or 28 of them of the points and the ones that they brought up in court so it was just another way of of confirming that he did it because you know when they did catch him he did confess to it uh with the one in calgary the first one there but uh, after he lawyered up he said that he didn't confess it he was forced to confess so they, they knew they couldn't use that confession in court. I, I mean, what was his demeanor? Was he kind of like, you got me, and he didn't have any remorse? I mean, what, was his, what were his thoughts about what he'd done? 
Not so much that. It was more, uh, he was very nonchalant. Like they, um, on the on the fourth girl there in Calgary, she was a teacher. And she was out on a date with him in his car. And another teacher drove up beside them on one of the main strips and saw the car and saw her with him. And they didn't bother them because she they thought, well, he, they're getting along great. So then when she didn't turn up for school and then they found her dead, they went to the school, of course, and talked to the teachers, and, and that teacher had said, hey, well, I saw her with this guy, and he was in a blue Mercedes, and he had this certain sticker in the back, and he also had one of those bobbleheads in the back <laughs> by the window that had a, um, a certain look to it. And so when the police run it, they found two blue Mercedes really close, and the one was his, and when they were outside staking him out, they saw that little head and the sticker, and so when they approached him at the house, he came in for questioning, and he was kind of like, yeah, nonchalant. And they even found cufflinks, a cufflink that was stuck in her body after he had killed her. And so they showed it to him, and he said, yeah, that's mine. Wow. And it was almost like, okay, um, so you did, oh, yeah, I was there, and I, you know, and, but he said he didn't kill her course he uh, had sex with her he said but he didn't kill her that was his and then eventually he confessed and um, then he got a lawyer and said no I I was forced to and so then uh, they did the dental impressions and and that sort of uh, was really the turning point for convicting him in that case his time in prison he did something very interesting <laughs> uh, a few years into his case and uh, it, it kind of boggles the mind how this ever happened. But it was, uh, I guess it was kind of a, well, obviously a big deal what, what, what he ended up doing a few years into his term. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, this is kind of, it, it, it's funny, but it's not. The, the, the American Express card was, because what he did was he applied for an American Express card and got it. <laughs> Even though he's a lifelong, he was convicted of four murders, put away for life with no chance of parole. Because in Canada, they don't do the death penalty. So you're in life, that's it. Um, so, but the, he gets an American Express card. It's like, how, do you, how does that happen? American Express said in their statement that they were, you know, finding out with an internal investigation how that happened, but they never did answer that. And so he, he, he another thing in Canada, especially back then, they still do this. They do compassion days for people that are put away for life with no chance of parole that are sexual assaulters, like they are, you know, um, raped someone or sexually assaulted someone, and they're away for life because uh, in, in prison, they're treated the worst. You know, they're at the bottom of the barrel. So they decide as a nation they would give them compassionate days because they're away for life. So they take them out for a day and they do something with them um, to help lift their spirits, I guess. I'm not quite sure on the logic. Um, so he would go out in day passes, and they would send him out with three guards and a professor of art to a museum and take him for lunch and uh, take him back to the uh, prison. So now, uh, of course, he would have to be a good prisoner. Like, he can't be <laughs> causing trouble or right. have write-ups in prison. He has to be... Uh, you know, one of those good good behavior prisons. So, but on the second outing, day day pass at the hotel, he uh, uh, needed to go to the bathroom. All three guards were having lunch, so they said go, and he never came back. <laughs> and so he actually had the American Express card on him as well, so they never searched him. The, the guards were reprimanded later for this. So, he went to a hotel and he went to the stores and he bought new clothes and he started going out to the bars and he actually was, was seeing two girls and one he was uh, kind of dating a little bit more intimately was uh, she was very interested in him and uh, it was like their second date at a pub where the police caught up with him and that's from using the card eventually of course. And uh, so they busted them both, and they took the girl as well as Wayne Bowden back to prison. And the the girl had no idea that she was actually going out with the vampire killer. Yeah, she's so, pretty she, fortunate that the, the police found her, because goodness knows what he would have done next. 
Well, yeah, and she was pretty um it really um freaked her out. Like she was really um disturbed by this and it really uh took its toll on her. That's the best way I can say it. She was pretty disturbed from this and even to this date. Um uh, it it really affected her life. It changed her life. So uh, it did it did have a quite an impact on her. So and um so they put him back in you know in prison and uh and took away his day pass. <laughs> yeah, I guess and a, so. And a, and a Mary An express, express card. card. Yes. Don't leave don't yeah. leave prison without it. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess you know that would be a good commercial. Yeah, there you go. Um, um well, so uh he passed in the 2000s of uh, of cancer, as I understand it. But but the thing is, is that, I mean, did he ever express any remorse? Did he ever, you know, do a public service announcement? You know, uh, I mean, no. did he ever do anything positive or did he just live out his days and, and kind of said, yeah, hey, he I did this? he lived out his days, died of skin cancer. Um, no, and in fact, um, you know, what he did write, like his diary after the fact diary, I, I, I call it sort of that because he started writing it in Calgary. And so it was, you know, years after even all the Montreal and stuff, because in, he was claiming in those memoirs that he just remembered it. It wasn't, he didn't know what happened. So when he actually was dating those girls, it would black out from the, the last date where he actually raped and killed them. He would remember up to that. And just in his mind, broke up with them. That was it. And then he moved on to the next girl. He said he didn't remember any of that stuff. When he moved to Calgary, the memory started coming into to him in dreams. So he started writing down his dreams. And, and he would dream about himself being a famous rock star. He, he kind of thought he would be like um, Jim Morrison of the Doors. He compared himself to that. And and that's how he wrote wrote himself. And so he, he would dream about himself being on a stage or somewhere popular. And then he started seeing these girls that he had dated and then killed. And the memory started coming back to him. So he so we only have his perspective from it, if that makes sense. So we don't know for a fact, but in his mind, it was all blacked out and came to him after the fact. So, so I don't I don't know what we can say about that. We can't really say that. What, what was that, right? And is this true? Um, I, I don't know. Is that his way? So that's the only sort of confession he's made toward any of this stuff. I guess, and this is a tough question because I don't know that there's a, a neat little bow to type this all up in. When we hear of a story... Whether it's a fictional story or it's a true-to-life story, a tragedy like this, a horrible thing, you, you would hope that at least we can gain some lesson of this. And I guess the one lesson I would say, just looking at it from your description of it, is be careful who you trust. Uh, but, I mean, is there any other direction, whether it's to prevent this from happening in the future to other people? Any thoughts do you have in anything that we can take from this? going forward and, and using it in a positive manner to maybe prevent other people from um, having a similar fate. You know, the, the kind of the theme at the beginning, I, I always kind of write a little thing, and I sort of think that um, it's back to, you know, it's something we all know. You can't judge a book by a cover. And, and, and in this way, it's the other way, not judging someone for something negative. Uh, we tend to look at good-looking people like he was a good-looking man, well-built. He had uh, soft-spoken, polite, um, you know, doing everything you think he should be. But because of that, he gained a lot of trust almost instantly because of those looks. Um, so we ju I think we just have to be aware that just because someone looks good, you know, it's the old thing, how could something that looks so good hurt me, Right. Right. Uh, and and that's it's kind of so it's kind of my my thought on it is we have to start start not just judge like not judging someone good on their looks just because they are they're really handsome and they're good looking and they're they're polite doesn't mean they have your best interest at stake right so and and we tend to do that automatically and uh you know he got jobs instantly because of his looks and manners 
he um, a woman would talk to him because he was soft spoken enough and polite and still good looking. So he had a he had a he had a real you know crowd around him all the time because of his looks. Meanwhile, he was not a very nice character. And whether it was mental or whether it was just who he was, I don't know. But the bottom line is, just because he looked good and spoke well, you still have to be cautious about how fast you invite someone to your house, <laughs> right? And, sure. and I think that's that. And that's kind of my my theme on this was, you know, don't be so quick, you know, especially nowadays with social media. And everybody meeting online and they meet people and give out their address and phone numbers and all the information almost instantly on a picture they see on online. And it's kind of that concept, just just because someone's really looks good and they say they're nice and they speak well, you have to get to know someone before you start letting them in your house and then start giving them all of your private information. That That was just my kind of thought on it. And that's kind of what I suggested, that maybe we should just take a little more time before we jump into things. And and in every one of these cases, that came true. Um, you know, the every single one of these um, it was almost instant, um, almost giving them the key to your apartment type thing. And uh, it didn't turn out. Yeah, they paid the ultimate price. Well... It is another cautionary tale. I think one thing of these kind of shows, I mean, people say, oh, you're being entertained by something that is, uh, you know, heinous or, or horrible. And, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, some people, you know, love the blood, love the gore. Uh, but the, the other thing I think that it does come out of true crime television programming, books, radio shows, podcasts, wherever it might be, is that. It may be, we don't really know how many people have stopped and thought and maybe not let somebody into their car or into their house or into their life because they saw that Dateline show or they read an Alan Warren book or maybe, you know, maybe somebody even listened to a Jim Harold podcast and said, well, maybe I'm going to check this person out. So actually, and I don't want to pat ourselves too much on the back here but 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 maybe you know that one thing because i've even struggled with it in producing this show is like do i really need to be doing a show on this because a lot of this stuff is pretty dark but the thing is is that the one thing that i think you can say that it does it kind of puts a mirror up to us and says say look you know there are you know i think inherently most people are good but there's yeah. uh, a percentage of people, and even if it's, there's a lot of people out there. So even if it's a small percentage, that's still a lot of bad people. And I think that if it makes us think twice uh, by reading a book, listening to a podcast, listening to a radio show, watching a TV show, that, that some good can come out of a program like this. Well, and that's a book why like I try yours. not to get, yeah, and I try not to get too involved in the details of the crime. It's kind of just to get the point across of what happened. But it's, it's it really, when you're looking at crime, we're really looking into ourselves and how we act and react around others. And, and I think that's important to, to do that. Um, not so much um, the crime itself. Like, we didn't talk about the gory details of these crimes. We, we really are talking about uh, what it does to ourselves. You know, what's, what's the overall effect that it has on us? You know, and what does it tell us about ourselves? Not so much about the crime, but just when we are involved in this and we talk about these, it makes you think about what you would do and how you react in your life. And so it tells us something about ourselves. Um, I, I, for me, anyway, because I'm really not focused on so much about all the details, how much blood, how much whatever. Well, it's been a cautionary tale yet again. We appreciate it. Alan, where can people find the book and more information about everything you do? Okay. The book is actually, uh, both, uh, all my books are out on, uh, of course, Amazon. Uh, I'm in uh, stores in uh, Barnes & Nobles in the States and Indy, and also in chapters in Canada. And uh, my website, personal website is somethingweirdmedia.com which the books are on there. I'm, I'm a co-host in some other shows that we do. And uh, we do a show out of Seattle that's based in true crime on Fridays at 4 p.m. 
in KKW 1150 AM, Seattle. Very good. Our guest has been Alan R. Warren. Alan, thank you for joining us again today. Thank you. And thank you for tuning into the crime scene. And as we kind of hinted at, be careful out there. We'll talk to you next time. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.